If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Flipping Out. Today, I have with me a very special guest, Jay Connor. Jay and I have known each other for probably about three years or so here through the Family Mastermind, which is a really good mastermind group we both belong to. And I found out Jay is an unbelievable piano player, by the way. Unbelievable. Really good. <laughs> Fantastic. Like one of the best I've ever seen. But that's one of his many special talents. He's obviously involved in the real estate world since I'm having him on here in the podcast. And he's got especially, pri he's the private money authority. That's always known. He's the private money guy here in a real estate investing business. He's been doing this for a very long time. We're going to get into his history and everything here, but I want to give a little bit of example here, some highlights. Eight million in private money to fund his deals. Average profits are around $78,000 per deal. Think about that $78,000 per deal. That's pretty darn good profits. Does three deals a month and only works about six hours a week. Tell me that's not a great lifestyle to have. Totally perfect for anybody who wants to get into this business. Jay also earns passive income um, by using private money to lend on different deals with different people. So that pretty much wraps that up. And, and he does, by the way, he has a free book. Let's get this link because I want to give it to you now and later. Um, he has a free book that you can get here and it's J Connor, C O N N E R.com forward slash book. It's a free book. The only thing you have to do is pay for shipping. It's going to be a great, great book for you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that book first? Hey, you want to just get invested, talk about investing real estate. Oh, sure. First of all, Paul, thank you so much for having me on here to talk about the subject that I'm so passionate about and that's private money how to never miss out on a deal. And when I talk private money, we're talking about doing business with individuals. We're not talking hard money. Uh, we're talking private money. And in this world, we never ask for money. We don't apply for loans and we'll talk all about that. But yes, my book, I'm so excited about it. The name of the book is where to get the money now. And the subtitle is how and where to get money for your real estate deals without relying on traditional or hard money lenders. And you can't even download the book. Um, uh, I autograph it. I'll ship it to you in the mail. Uh, just cover shipping. It's 20 bucks on Amazon, but it's free here with shipping uh, on your show, Paul. But yeah, I mean, this lays out step by step how I've got all the private money, how you can get all the private money you would ever want for your deals and how to never miss out on a deal for not having the funding. And, and that's a book everybody in this audience is going to want to have for sure, because I can tell you right now, especially in the great environment we are in, private money is the best. And I am raising more and more private money. And most of my deals personally are being funded with private money as well, rather than the hard money or the asset based lenders. And Jay will get into details as to why it's so much better to use private money than it is to use asset based lenders and all these different funding things. Um, but first, before we do that, Jay, why don't you get into when you started real estate? You're one of the OGs in this business. You've been in here for a long time. Why don't you tell us when you first started and what your first deal was like? Because I do remember the story and it's a really good one. The audience is going to love. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, my wife, Carol Joy, and I, we've been full time investing in single family houses here in eastern North Carolina ever since 2003. So yes, we've been doing this for a couple of, a couple of decades. And, um, for the first six years, uh, Paul, that we were in the business, I relied on the local bank to fund our deals. And <clears throat> that's all I knew to do. I didn't know anything about private money. I didn't know anything about self-directed IRAs and all that. So from 2003 until January, 2009, I would just, having the local bank fund my real estate deals. And then in January, 2009, I had two properties under contract to buy. And believe it or not here in North Carolina, we actually still have handsets with uh, cords attached to them. Can you believe that? But anyway, I, I called up my banker sitting right here at this desk 
I called up my banker, told him about my two deals that I had under contract. And my, and my banker and I had had this conversation many, many times. <clears throat> and I learned on that phone call that my line of credit had been closed with no notice. And I said to my banker, I said, what in the world? Why are you shutting down my line of credit? He said, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? And I said, no, but now I got a financial crisis going on because I got two deals that I want to buy that I can't fund. So anyway, my definition of coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. In less than two weeks, I learned about private money and I was able to attract and raise $2,150,000 in less than 90 days. And so my banker actually did me a favor. It's the biggest blessing in disguise in this business I've ever had. All I had was a million dollar line of credit back then, but now I've got double the money, uh, you know, in less than 90 days, I was able to close <clears throat> on those two deals. And since that time, Paul, I haven't missed out on a deal for not having the funding for my deals. And that is the most important thing, right? Because you can't always rely on the banks whenever there's something crazy going on in the world, like what, the war in Ukraine or Israel and the Gaza Strip and everything that's going on there. Banks tend to tighten, financial institutions tighten. So you need to be able to get private money from individuals that want to invest and still get a good rate of return in something that's very secure, like real estate investing. But it just gave you the flexibility, Jay, to be able to do this. And then you realize, I don't need the banks anymore. Your story and mine are very, very similar. Um, I, and I started investing at the end of 2001. So you and I are about the same time hit the financial crisis, the banks just shut down, like you said, in January, stopped everything. So I had to go raise a bunch of private money to do it as well. And that's where I've been going ever since. Yes, I still do use asset-based lenders as well. But like I said, I'm trying to go full-fledged just private lenders right now because the asset-based lenders are asking for too much and there's just too much paperwork and details that I don't want to deal with there. So you got the right way to do it, Jay. And you also do some creative financing deals, if I'm not mistaken, too. Oh, right. yes, absolutely. I, um, I buy, um, I buy houses subject to the existing note, meaning the seller of the house, uh, is willing to sell me the property, transfer the title. And, um, and I agree to make their mortgage payments. So the mortgage stays in their name. And typically my criteria, Paul, is if I buy on terms with creative financing, I'll, I'll typically turn around and sell on terms. So yeah. I've sold a lot of homes on rent to own or lease purchase. That's one of the same thing. But when I'm using private money <clears throat> and I'm paying all cash for the property, typically I'll cash out because I don't want to leave that cash and that private money buried in that house for a yes. long period of time. Yeah. That makes total sense there. And also when you were talking about the subject too, I think we're now in the times where subject two is going to be some of the best deals out there considering so many mortgage rates are 3% or 4% or below over the years. So to be picking up these types of properties, <clears throat> pardon me, that you can't get financing at that low of a rate anymore is going to be huge for the future. So that just fits and feeds your model even more. Absolutely. And, um, a good friend of ours, and I know, you know, him, Jason Hartman, oh, yeah. if you haven't had Jason on your show recently, I highly recommend him to you, Paul. Uh, I had him on mine recently and he just gave some interesting statistics last week and it's right around, it's over 80%. In fact, I think it's closer to 90% of all the mortgages, active mortgages in the United States right now, the interest rates on all those mortgages are less than 4%. A lot of them are in the threes yes. and you're right. I mean, buying a house subject to the existing note and inheriting that kind of interest rate, that would be a property you want to hang on to for the long term. Absolutely. I mean, you can cash flow it as a rental compared to now with rates in the 8% range where it's much more difficult to cash flow as a rental. So we're just in a different market and I am going to be having Jason on Jay. So it's funny you say that you and I both know him very well. Brilliant, brilliant mind really understands finance and what's going on with mortgage rates and rentals and, you know, even doing out of state rentals and all this kind of stuff. So he's going to be a great guy to have on here shortly. I'll probably have him on next month. Um, but let's talk a little bit further about you. you I believe you have an educational program, do you not? 
Yes, as a matter of fact, um, we just had our live event uh, last week uh, here in Moorhead City, Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. Um, had a lot of real estate investors come in from all over the nation. And um, so when you uh, order my book and get it in the mail, you actually, right here, you get two free tickets to this $3,000 event. So uh, not only the book, but you get live and in-person uh, training by yours truly at my live events that I do throughout the year. And Jay, your live events are great. I've, I've seen them and I've seen the virtually and stuff. Your live events are spectacular and you get in a lot of different things there. So that is a great giveaway as well here. Besides just your book, going to the event is going to be well worth it. And your market where you are in North Carolina, and I do a lot of deals in North and South Carolina, they're two of my favorite markets and they always have been. They're always so consistently good. And you got such a great variety of real estate throughout the state. You know, you got beachfront property. Um, then you can go further inland and you got like Ashland, North Carolina, where you're in the Smoky Mountains and beautiful areas. You can actually ski out there. You have such a different um, variety of real estate and price points too. the markets where Jason, I'll talk about this, where your linear markets, where it doesn't go up crazy, they're nice and steady and they cash flow. And then you have markets that, you know, obviously near the coast can be totally different because everything's very expensive near the coast. And then you have Charlotte, which has been one of just the best cities in this country as far as growing and being consistent since like around 1987 or so. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think you do most of yours in the state of North Carolina, right? Most of your deals. Yes. Um, so all of our own deals that we do are right here in Eastern North Carolina. And, you know, there's an important lesson here. My total target market that we invest in in single family houses uh, is only 40,000 people, wow. 40,000 people. But we do, as you said, two to three deals a month on average. And our average profits are $78,000. So I don't share that to pat myself on the back. I share that to make a point. And that is you don't have to be investing in a large market to make significant income. In fact, there's a lot to be said for investing in uh, smaller markets like I'm in, because you just don't have the numbers of real estate uh, investor competition, uh, you know, like you do in the large markets. Are there other real estate investors here in my market? Of course, but not near the market or not near the number that, you know, in really, really, um, you know, big cities. So, you know, I advise um, my mastermind members to, instead of investing like in the city, if you're in your big city, go in the outlying areas around the city where people will be driving into the city to work. You just don't have the competition in those outlying areas as you do right inside the cities. That is so true. And that's our bread and butter, right? That's our bread and butter, what we do. Um, we buy all over the country, but mostly we buy in more of the rural markets. The populations, like you're saying, 40,000 or a lot of times under that too. And other investors just don't understand for whatever reason, new investors think they want to be in like a big city like St. Louis or Philadelphia, or they have to be in Dallas or these markets in Phoenix, Arizona. But what they don't realize is the competition is so great. It's just going to totally dilute your returns on it. Where if you're in these more rural markets, and there's two reasons I like the rural markets better. Um, the first one being you don't have as much competition. So you're going to have bigger spreads like you have, Jay, like we have as well in these markets. And the second big thing I really like about it is there's still an exodus from the big cities to these rural and sometimes very rural markets that's going to continue because we still have baby boomers retiring and we still have um, the millennials going from the city to more rural areas to raise their families and Gen Z will be the next ones following in line doing the same thing. But the big cities aren't the attractors that they used to be since obviously the pandemic kind of pushed a lot of people out of the cities. But I think that model is absolutely beautiful, Jay. And we do the same. And you only have to do three deals a, a month when you're making $78,000 per deal and still pay your team and still live a pretty good lifestyle. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Now, when you do, just to get an idea, a little flavor on how you do it, do you guys do direct mail um, campaigns? Do you guys do pay per click? Do you guys go on Facebook? How do you find your deals? Sure. So um, we do it multiple ways. And you bring up a good point here, Paul. Unless 
you as a real estate investor have consistent seller leads coming in every day. You got a hobby and you don't have a business. So true. I mean, that's, that's the foundation right there. Having consistent seller leads. So how do we get them? Well, first of all, my foreclosure system, Carol, Joy and I started putting our foreclosure system together back all the way in 2004. And what we do is we track and we direct mail with eight sequential direct mail letters to every foreclosure in our market, in our County. Um, so we do the direct mail to the foreclosures. Secondly, we do Google pay per lead. We don't do Google pay per click. Uh, I've got three different companies. And so I like, I like dominate the market because when someone goes to Google and searches for sell my house fast or buy my house fast or anything like that, the top three that come up are all three companies of mine, right? So I'm like competing with myself on purpose. So Google search, right? So those are the hottest leads because those owners and sellers are looking for us, right? Yeah. I only need five of those leads to buy one house, five of those leads to buy one house. And I only pay $150 per lead on those. Then in addition to that, I have uh, Facebook ads. So I have two different campaigns of Facebook ads that just come up in people's uh, news feed on their Facebook. I've got a distressed seller or distressed owner ad. And then I've got what I call the, the uh, generic campaign. And then in addition to that, I've got a full time 40 hour a week outbound caller. Mm -hmm. And my favorite list to call right now are two. One are tired landlords. And my other favorite list right now is out of state absentee owners that <clears throat> are inherited properties out of state absentee inherited properties. And those two lists are my favorite list to outbound call. And those are the best lists. Let me tell you, and talking to so many real estate investors out there, those are the two biggest ones right now, the tired landlords and the out of state absentee and the inheritance list, especially. So these two nuggets of gold, you're given huge nuggets of gold here, Jay. I really appreciate that there for the audience, for people that do the direct mail advertising out there. Those are going to be your two best campaigns. Um, if you get into doing some of the pre foreclosure stuff, it gets a little bit different. And there's a lot of people that probably get into those mailing campaigns. You do it, I think the right way, just going directly to the people locally in your market, I think as well on that one. Um, but no, the absentee owners, these are people, the tire landlords, the absentee out of state people that inherit these properties. They don't want it. They don't want these properties. So they're going to work with you much easier than going directly to somebody who maybe is going to be forced to sell their home, but they don't really want to. Right. That's so, right. right. And you got the outbound caller, full-time person doing outbound calling for you. Um, do you do text blasting or anything like that as well, or just do the outbound or just do mm. the, I think what you've got is more than enough to really feed you with leads, but have you tried? Oh, sure. So we do not cold outbound text. But what we do is on our direct mail, they have the option to either pick up the phone and call us or text us. Beautiful. And if they text us, then we reply to that text by a text. And here's what's interesting. Uh, my statistics show when you direct mail and you give the, um, the person you're mailing the option to either pick up the phone or text 70% will call you 30% will text you. And so you don't want to miss out on 30% of your responses if you don't offer the texting option. Now, I don't know what percentage of those 30% would call if they didn't have the option to text, but it is interesting to note that when you give both options, it's 70% call, 30% text. That is very interesting. And I guess depending on your market, right? So if you have an older market, you're generally going to get way more calls and way less text. But if you have a younger market demographics, that may switch from area to area. One of the questions I wanted to ask you in your particular market, and did you say you're in Morgan City, was it? Uh, Moorhead City. Moorhead, Moorhead City. City, right. Moorhead City. Um, what is your average cost per acquisition in, in Moorhead City? Yeah. So when you pile it all in one great big pile, we're, we're,
that's that's a great number to be at. Um, so your average cost per deal is two thousand dollars, which is sensational. And so you take seventy eight thousand, you're still seventy six thousand profit there, minus the other overhead and stuff you have, which is terrific. What is your average cost per house to purchase a house? Do you have an average cost set up in that or no? Sure. So our median price right now is around three hundred twenty five thousand dollars. So the average cost really comes down to how I buy it. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm buying it and there's a major rehab involved, I'm typically buying those houses around 50% mm -hmm. of the after repaired value. For example, I just went under contract uh, this past Thursday on a house. The after repaired value is $330,000. Okay. Well, I'm buying that house for 175,000. Um, and the rehab on it is going to be right around 60,000. Okay. So that's a, that's a good example of what we're doing. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. And as er every investor will tell you, you make money when you buy it. So a lot of times newer investors will be, oh, this is worth 320 fixed up. I could pick it up for maybe two or two and a quarter. You're overpaying when you do that. You're not giving yourself any kind of a margin you really need to in this environment, especially with the rates going up, you need to be a little bit more careful give yourself a little more margin and your 50% number is just spot on. That's exactly what we use as well on that. Um, that's just spot on. And it gives you a little bit of margin because sometimes those 60 K rehabs, you, you find something you didn't expect and they go to 75 or 80, right? <laughs> we both well, I can tell you, I, I don't know in all these years, whenever I bought a house and it had a rehab, even when I'm getting, and you always want to get a home inspection before you close. Yeah. But even when you have the home inspection, um, Murphy shows up in every house yes. and, and, and I would, I would think uh, your listeners and viewers know who Murphy is, uh, but, but in addition to Murphy, I mean, sometimes Murphy's cousins, Murphy's brothers, Murphy's sisters show up. So when I'm calculating my maximum offer, when I'm going to pay all cash, if it's under an after repaired value of 300,000, I always throw in at least an additional $10,000 for the unexpected on my estimation of repairs. But here's the deal though. The magic is really not in estimating the repair cost, even though that's important, of course, but the magic is not in the repair estimate. The magic is in your offer. Yeah, no, that is absolute truth. <laughs> it's the truth. And um, you know, and that, and that, and that triggers another important lesson that I learned a long time ago. And that is a seller of a property really has got no idea of what they will accept until you make the offer, regardless of what they say. So for example, this house that I just talked about that we have under contract to buy the seller, it's an inherited house. All right. It's an inherited house in a really, really nice neighborhood. And the seller told my acquisitionist that, she would not accept one penny less than $200,000. In fact, she said exactly. And I quote, she says, if you don't pay me $200,000, I'll let the house sit there and rot. <laughs> wow. So, so our offer was $175,000 and we'll close in seven days, all cash and in the offer, I said, and your taxes have got to be paid current. I knew it was a tax delinquent house mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. owed over $5,000 in taxes because I had my attorney check the title on that. And so the seller comes back and says, well, if you, if, if I, if you reduce the price from 175 to 170, uh, can we do that? So I don't have to pay the taxes out of pocket. So here she is actually selling the house $30,000 less than quote unquote, I'll let the house sit there and rot. I mean, for goodness <laughs> sakes, it's free and clear. There's no mortgage on this house. Right? So, you know, Paul, I never bought a house that I never made an offer on. So make offers, make your offer. If you want the house, regardless of what the seller is saying. So true. And a lot of times a new, newer person investing in real estate will get intimidated by a statement like that. 
but somebody experienced like you, you know, there's still margin there and there's ways to do it. And I think one of the, one of the things you said just a couple of minutes ago that really proves that if you get a home inspection on every deal, right? So that home that's inspection. Right. Well, is, when there's a rehab involved, absolutely. Right. So when you do those on there's going to be a rehab that gives you an ability to really push the price down because now you're showing your the seller, look how many repairs are needed here. I have got a lot of repairs, more than I thought. I really need to get this price down to here to make it make sense. It gives you a negotiating uh, tactic, really, more or less. Absolutely. But it's something that's a must on anything you rehab now. Do you wholesale a lot of houses? Is Do you have a model where you do a certain amount of wholesale, a certain amount of rental, a certain amount of rehab? Or do you kind of let each deal dictate it? You know what's funny, Paul? In all these years, since 2003, I've never wholesaled a deal in my life. I know how to wholesale, but there's two reasons I've never wholesaled a deal. I've stayed in every deal I've ever done. Two reasons. Number one, I ain't got nobody to wholesale it to. <laughs> I'm, my market is so small. But the the really the big reason I've never wholesaled a deal is I like seventy eight thousand dollars better than seventy eight hundred. I think that is so smart because look, when you wholesale these deals, you are, you have to sell it at a discount to, to the buyer to do it. And our model is the exact same as yours. And now we're buying mostly bank owned properties. So we buy them, relist them or do rehab on them or do a lot of what's called wholetailing. So that leads me to my next question because we want the bigger spreads, just like you're talking about there. And the only way to really do that is to get the house put on the MLS where the most eyes are on it and finish to an end buyer there as compared to, a, a another investor and like you said there's just not a lot of investors in your market so you would have to take smaller spreads in order to do to do that um do you do a lot of wholesales in this current market or do you are you still doing a lot of full-scale rehabs do you have a percentage going either way on that yeah most of them are full-scale rehabs um and but when i'll buy on terms um subject to the existing note as I said earlier, most of the time I'm going to turn around and sell that on terms. Mm -hmm. And when I do, I'm not doing anything to that house. I'm going to make sure it's clean. I'm going to make sure it's smelling good. But you know, if the walls are purple or orange or pink, we tell our buyers, we'll say, you know, we're not going to paint the walls because you're going to paint them the color you want anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, as again, we make sure they're clean, but but we'll give a, a, a slight discount off of the uh, current value. So we're not putting any money to speak of in the house. Yeah. And you're making the money in the spread. So you're essentially kind of almost doing a wrap deal. You have your terms, say it's the mortgage tax and insurance around 1200 a month. You're finding an end buyer, sell it to them for an increased amount and increased terms where maybe you're getting 16 or $1,700 per month on that. Is, is that basically the, the gist of it? That's the gist of it. You got it. And that is powerful because let me tell you, when you just flip or just wholesale deals, that's a paycheck one day. What Jay is doing, this is a paycheck every month. Money is coming in each month and you can extend these out long terms. Um, you could, if you wanted to, Jay, if you need, when you're buying on terms, you have to worry about it. But if there's a deal you wanted to do this, that you had to take down for one reason or another, you could always refinance this, right? And then sure. still sell it on terms if you wanted to. Yeah. And I mean, over the years, I've sold a lot of homes that I actually funded with private money and I would uh, get a, a, a positive cash flow spread and, and sell it on terms. So whether you buy all cash, I just I just don't want one thing I learned the hard way <laughs> is even though when I force somebody into credit repair and I get 80 percent of them to cash out those other 20 percent, I just got tired of rehabbing them more than once. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so if I'm doing a major rehab and I'm turning it into a beautiful brand new looking home that's ready for Southern Living Magazine pictures, <laughs> I'm not selling that house on terms. I've been down that road. Yeah. But uh, if I'm not having to put any money in the house as far as renovation or et cetera, then uh, I'm glad to sell it on terms. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree and concur. I've run into the same issues myself with Salmon Terms. And I, after you did the full scale rehab, and it's amazing how quickly they can those houses can deteriorate when people are rough on them and beating them up a little bit. And then you've got another rehab. Yeah, it's not going to be the same full scale rehab you had before, but it's still a lot more money that you're putting into that deal. You are so right. So you either got to decide to keep it just as a rental 
and do it as rental. Now, do you do many rentals that you have, or are you more just terms with people? Yeah, um, yeah. it's going to be it's going to be mostly terms uh, if I'm not cashing out in the MLS. Because, and you know why that's so smart? No tenants, no toilets, no deal with any of that kind of <laughs> stuff. No property management as we know in this business. It's right. And that smart. brings up a good point because when we sell a home on rent to own, after 30 days, they're responsible for all the repairs. Okay. Um, so, you know, these rent to own buyers, they don't have the same mindset as a renter. I mean, we, we tell them at the closing table, and these are the exact words we use. We say for all practical purposes, this is your home. We just, I mean, this is your house. This is your property. Um, you want to paint the walls, paint the walls, whatever you want to change out the floor cover and have at it. Um, and the difference is we just aren't going to transfer title to your name until you're ready for a mortgage. Yes. Yeah, so I, I just have a deal now. This is interesting. The timing of it. So it was one of those I sold with terms to somebody in Chesterfield, Indiana. Uh, and they paid, all, they finally paid me off here after nine years. So it was nine years of payments that I got here. I can't tell you how high that profit was. It was phenomenal. And now I am selling it to them. So basically we're just taking it to the title company and doing a D transfer for them um, right now at this point. Then that's super fun for them. And let me tell you, I didn't put a penny into this property over the years. If I had it as a rental, I would have dumped thousands upon thousands of dollars. So think about if you want rental, that's great. But if you really want a hands off business, this is going to be much easier. So it depends what you want. Depends what your personality is. Jay and I both like having less of the rentals and more of the owner finance because the mailbox money is great without the tenants and toilets. But if you want to build and really have um, tax write offs, then unfortunately, you do need to have some rentals or some other ways to offset taxes. And there are other ways, and Jay and I know other ways that we could do it without having to have the rentals as well. But uh, Jay, this is awesome, awesome stuff. Is there anything that I missed that you have in your business or what you're doing that you want to tell the audience before we wrap up here? Well, I want to emphasize that point um, that I made when we started out about private money. In this world of raising private money, there's no applications. Your credit score has got nothing to do with it. And people ask me all the time, they say, Jay, how do you have all that private money available for your deals? And you don't ask anybody for money. Well, here's the answer. I put on my teacher hat, my private money teacher hat. We've got 47 private lenders right now funding our deals. And I didn't ask any of them to loan me money. And they say, Jay, how do you do that? Well, here's how it works. And I'll break it down. First of all, we separate the conversations of teaching our private lending program and then having a deal to fund. You see, desperation has got a smell to it, right? The worst time to be raising private money is when you need it for a deal. Correct. And I'll tell you, Paul, the, 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 the educators out there that teach real estate investing that teach just get the deal under contract the money will show up i want to throw up where in the world is the money going to show up is it just going to run out of clouds so i teach the uh, i teach and practice the opposite the money comes first in fact i was a guest i mean there's always going to be deals there's always going to be deals i was guest i was a guest on another podcast not too long ago and the host of that show he and i were having this conversation and i said why in the world do they say that? And he says, Jay, I can tell you. I said, why? He says, because they're selling a course on how to get a deal under contract. <laughs> yeah, very true. That's exactly so, right. <laughs> so how does this work? Well, I put on my teacher hat and I teach people in what I call my warm market. People that I've got some kind of association with. I go to church with them. They're in my cell phone. They're on my email list. They're at the Rotary Club. They're at Business Networking International. You know, the different groups that I'm in. So when I first started raising private money, that's all I did. I put on my teacher hat and I started teaching my program. You see, in this world, we make the rules. And in my book at jconnor.com forward slash book, I go over exactly what my private lending program is that I teach new potential private lenders. So I teach them the program. Uh, I, you know, if they've got retirement funds to use to invest, 
You know, I introduce them to my self-directed IRA company that I refer all my private lenders to that have retirement funds. So mm -hmm. we teach them the program. They love the program. They tell me how much they've got to invest. And then I tell them, I will put your money to work for you just as soon as possible. So you see, I'm not, I'm not pitching a deal in that conversation. Now I'll call them up. And don't wait too long because private money can disappear on you. Quick. I'll call them up. And here's my exact script that I say to them. I get them on the phone. We say a little hello. And I say, I've got great news for you. This is called the great news phone call. I say, I got great news for you. I can now put your money to work. And then I tell them four things about the deal. And that's quite frankly, more than they want to know. <laughs> I say, I've got a house in Newport. So I'll tell them the location. I don't tell them the physical address. They could care less. I got a house in Newport. Second bit of information. I say the after repaired value is 200,000. So I tell them the after repaired value. I'll tell them the funding required for the deal. The funding required for the deal is 150,000. That's 75% of the after repaired value. And I'll tell them the closing date and the closing date is next Tuesday. So you'll need to have your funds wired to my real estate attorney by next Monday. End of conversation. I didn't ask them if they wanted to do the deal. That's the most stupid question in the right. world I could ever ask them. Of course they want to do the deal, particularly if they have moved their retirement funds over to the self-directed IRA company. They're not earning any money there. They're waiting for the good news phone, good news phone call for me to put their money to work for them. So again, we teach the program, which is in the book, and then we tell them we'll put their money to work for them just as soon as possible. And we call them up with good news. We can put their money to work for them. And that's it. No asking, no chasing, no begging, no persuading. We just serve them. It's all leading with a servant's heart and making a difference in their financial future. And that is a win-win for everybody. And that is such a great way to raise private money. <laughs> it's so awesome. So you could fund students deals with, with those guys um, money as well. So which is just tremendous, but I, I do love your method and how you teach private lending and how you teach raising private lending because you're right. Cause nobody else out there teaches it like that. They're teaching you to show your deal go in and, and the private lenders looking and seeing how that's, you got to close by next week. Now I can create my terms on everything. Whereas you, you're bringing in showing them a deal. Here's the terms. Here's the information. If you want to invest in it, you got to have the funds in there next week, right? You're creating that's urgency right. on that side. So brilliant. I absolutely love it. Jay. That is absolutely sensational. That's yeah. it. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Paul. I appreciate it so much. And again, uh, I am glad to uh, mail my book in the mail to uh, everyone that would like a copy at jconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash book. Awesome. And definitely grab that book. I do have that book. I have read a bit of that book. It's awesome. It's still on my list to finish. I got so many other things going on right now, but Jay, it is a great book and I appreciate you getting me that as well. You got it, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on and we'll talk to you soon. All right. See ya. See ya. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor.